Um, welcome to Turner Dodge. I'm Liz Homer. I'm the curator at Turner Dodge. And before I introduce our speaker, I just want to mention a couple of things that are going to happen during this month on Father's Day, which is June 17th, I think it is. We're going to have a brunch for, for fathers and whoever wants to bring them. And I encourage you to do that. And then the other thing that's coming up is the dedication of Turner Dodge. The restoration is coming to a close. It isn't complete right now, but on the 17th of July, we'll have a free concert on the lawn. That's where you bring a lawn chair, come out on the, on the uh, lawn, and um, it's a fun time. And before that, at 6.30, we'll have our dedication in the gardens, and we're going to be erecting a uh, um, fountain in the gardens that was um, part of our local history as well. The Women's Christian Temperance Union had a fountain on the corner of Washington and Michigan, and um, it is now going to be moved into our garden. It oh. fits, fits very well with the history of the house and the people who lived here. And um, now I'll just tell you a little bit about Julie Avery, and I'll tell you one adventure that I had with Julie. Mm -hmm. Julie has been interested in fairs for quite a long time, and she was involved with the state fair. And we would have MSU go down there and put on a, a, a whole section of the fair that would duplicate the kinds of things that would be at the early fairs at the t turn of the century and so forth. And um, uh, for the anniversary of women's right to vote in, in 1995, I was invited as the curator at the Women's Hall of Fame to put up a tent like the suffrage tent. We had a, picture of the suffrage tent with all the suffrage signs and where the costumes <coughs> were part of her exhibit. And uh, so that gives you an idea of some of the things she's done with fairs. Um, she'll probably tell you about how she got involved with, with um, the fairs. She's a um, curator at the MSU Museum and an administrator there. Um, but the most exciting part right now for us is the part about the fairs and, and the way she's she found these posters and what she did with them, and I'll let her talk about that. Okay. Thank you. I'm Julie Avery. I work at the MSU Museum. Thank you for having me here, and thank you for coming. Um, as a grown-up, I went back to college and uh, wanted to get a PhD, and I was the only one in my family that ever did that, and I did it as a grown-up. And I, I wanted, I, my research looked at the early county fair as a community arts organization. Everybody knows that the fairs had agriculture and animals, but they also had the arts. And right from the very first of our fairs in America, there were arts there. There were domestic arts that ranged all the way from cooking to ornamental and totally decorative arts. Um, when I was researching my dissertation, I uh, stumbled across an old, an antique poster advertising a fair in Ohio, 1897, great big poster, wonderful old image on it, and it was at um, one of these antique shows that are at fairgrounds. <coughs> and I spied it, you know, from a long way away and hoofed right over there, and it was way more than I could afford at the time, but I wrote down the name of the company that printed it, and I thought, well, I'll look in old, um, city directories and gazetteers and I'll see what I can do to find out about this company. Well, lo and behold, the company was still in existence. The Fair Publishing House uh, in Norwalk, Ohio, and I called him up and talked to a man who'd been on the job two days and said, I saw this old poster and I want to know if you have these posters around. Um, well, he had heard about the old art and he would get back to me. And a couple days later, he called very excited. And um, in the third floor attic of the family home, under a bed, wrapped in newspaper, were 258 oh, artworks. Oh, and what? mainly what I want to do today, and I have chills now, and I had chills then. It was probably one of the most exciting adventures of my life to help this company rediscover this wonderful treasure that they had. And now it is. Um, at MSU, we don't own it, but we're caretakers of it, and they have given us permission to use it for research <coughs> and for exhibition and for um, educational purposes. Um, 
In a lot of my programs, I, I ask the audience, and I'll ask you, what do you think is American about America's fairs? What is it? Antiques Any guess? And culture. They what? Antiques and culture. Antiques and culture. Yeah. Any other ideas? It's a family affair. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Family. Yeah. Well, what is the real unique thing about America's fairs is that um, our fairs became educational institutions. European fairs, English fairs, even Asian fairs started as. Um, marketplaces on trade routes where people would barter and exchange goods. Um, like everything, we brought fairs into America. And the first fairs started out like this, as marketplaces. And also, er early English fairs were gentlemen's learned societies where wealthy landowners would get together periodically. And they would share information with one another. They would do little research and they would plant experimental plots and then they would, they would talk about that with one another. While they were wealthy landowners, they had serfs and others to do the work for them. In America, this kind of fair didn't work because A, we didn't have wealthy landowners. Um, so ultimately, a man named Elkanah Watson uh, is called the father of America's fairs because he realized that to become self-sufficient, um, the farmer had to be plentiful we had to be self-sufficient with food and also with clothing because we were bringing all this stuff from England. Until we could do it ourselves, um, we wouldn't be able to do this. So in Berkshire, um, Massachusetts, Alcana Watson created an agricultural society and started what is the model of today's fairs. Um, a gathering of people, a sharing of successes in livestock and crops and domestic arts, you know, every, what, whatever people did well, they brought it to the fair and they shared it. And Elkanah made the fair very democratic, was open to everyone. The competitions were there to inspire people, to encourage them. If you were very successful with hogs, people in the neighborhood would see that. If I was a great quilter, people would see that. And then, then the neighbors would learn from one another. And Elkanah Watson was smart in lots of ways and he determined that it had to be a family affair. Because if it wasn't a family affair, if the men just had to run and check it out and then go home, um, they wouldn't be able to spend the time to learn from one another. And so right from the first um, of the fairs in America that are, that are considered the, what we've contributed to fairs, they were multiple days usually. They engaged the whole family, all ages, children and adults, all parts of the family, all parts of the community, and then agriculture was our industry. And, but the bankers and the merchants were part of that community setting. And so the fair also celebrated community. So what I want to share with you, <coughs> I don't cough a lot, is some of the pictures of the artwork and the lithographs that are from this collection. And um, I'll let the pictures kind of tell the story. We don't have a lot of time, and so I'm not going to pause a lot on them. I'm just going to share them with you, and we'll certainly have some time for questions. If you have a question, just you know, let me know, and we'll just deal with it right then. So lights, please. <coughs> um, these two ladies always intrigued me. Um, and people who are aware of American history and sometimes Grange history know what they are, but they, they are very confusing to a lot of scholars who started to look at this collection. But these ladies are Ceres and Pomona, the goddess of grains and of fruit, and they're part of Grange ritual. And so here we present the fair. In the history of our fairs, um, we know the fair is a big community event. Um, it is very romantic and idealized, kind of bucolic setting. The fair involved everything, from animals to um, horse racing. The best was brought to the fair, whether it was your quilting square or your best stud bowl. <coughs> the fair is where you brought them, other people saw them and acknowledged you know, everybody's work. Here's a wonderful, romanticized, bucolic setting. Um, this artwork, it, I wondered at first if it was more cartoonish uh, but I think it's pretty representative now that we've had livestock experts look at them. 
This represents um, the standard of livestock at that time. In the background, in the center, in the very back, there's an exhibit of windmills. There's four windmills there. This collection not only shows us fashion and livestock, but um, architecture, exhibition architecture. Here's, um, does that look sharp to you? This little guy reminds me of Howdy Doody. <laughs> but this is a, a family going to the fair. Um, fairs have always been intergenerational. City folks came to the fair. They brought their children, just as they do today, to see different animals. The fair was a place where you dressed up. Can you imagine going to the fair in 80 degree weather, wow. dressed yeah. to the gills? <coughs> but yet we have a lot of historic pictures that, that verify that people did dress to go to the fair. To see things and be seen, I say. <coughs> And the little kids came to the fair, too. Um, in the 1920s, 1910s, there was an effort of, at, that resulted in baby contests at fairs. And this seems very strange until you realize that the government made this effort to help educate parents. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> educate parents <coughs> more about having healthy babies. So this is where baby contests occurred at fairs. Here's some exhibition architecture in the back. <clears throat> and this interesting tandem hitch in the center, a, a cart with two horses pulling it, one right in front of the other. That's called a tandem hitch. Here's another example. Uh, this is used in competition today still at fairs. And the first horse um, is not really attached to the sled, so you have to have a very well-trained horse. <coughs> the fair involved racing, and right from the first, um, when people traveled to the fair, there often were you know races on the road to get there. Who had the best road horse, and that ultimately translated itself into the fair. And again, all of these pieces are pieces of art that were created to make advertising posters for fairs. And we have the catalogs from this company between 1880 and current. And we can see in the catalogs um, how these posters were used. And we have some examples a little bit later. Uh, many people will say to me, well, that couldn't possibly be like that. You wouldn't walk a bull on just a lead like that. But when you, when you handle bulls all the time, when they were a part of your life, and they weren't just isolated from everyone, then you could have a bull that was trained well enough and behaved well enough to do this. And here's another example where all of these animals are exhibited together and judged together. And again, we have historic photos that demonstrate this. <clears throat> um, equipment was at the fair too, and we have a steam traction engine in the back and a threshing machine. Uh, the newest of equipment from sewing machines to um, farm equipment was brought to the fair, just as the newer breeds uh, here's another example of a windmill uh, exhibit, a little bit in the center there in the back, and some exhibition architecture. <coughs> the Ferris wheel now is just about 110 or 115 years old, so that kind of places the date of these. This one is um, one of my favorites because the house back there, and you can't really tell it, one sign above the door says Floral Hall, and one says Women's Work. And this was the area of the fair that I was especially interested in my research. <coughs> this is a fun picture reminiscent of the ladies' sewing club, you know, that brought their stuff to the fair. <coughs> Most of this artwork is not signed by artists. There are seven artists that have signed work out of the 250 pieces. Only about 50 of them are signed, and this is Walter Lehman's work, as was the ladies behind this. Um, I think Walter was a trained artist. I've done some research in the Midwest trying to find a Walter Lehman, and through the census <coughs> records and things like that, I have not been able to find him. I found a couple Walter Lehmans, but I think this man would say he was an artist, and so I don't think I found him. This is one of the first pictures I saw when we pulled the stuff out from underneath the bed. 
which the pig in the lower left corner, I thought, well, this is truly a, ca a cartoon. <laughs> but this pig is an Ohio improved Cheshire White, and this pig was bred um, to make the lard. And then after the wars, uh, when lard wasn't needed anymore, it was used in ammunition and explosives. And as we become more interested in not having fat in our meats, then you know we breed animals for different purposes. Now the next couple are some examples for you of the original artwork and then the lithograph poster that was inspired by it. Now here's a nice example. This is an original piece. And this is what the lithograph looked like. And they would, they would produce fair blanks. And for example, um, the white paper that's underneath the picture would go down another two-thirds two as much as the size. Does that make sense to you? And then they would pr do the lithographic print of the artwork, and then as the Ingham County Fair or the Kalamazoo County Fair or the State Fair, as they would order what they wanted, they would identify the picture they wanted and pick the words, and then they would be printed on them. There are very few of these poster blanks or posters uh, that we have. And you know they were made to put up on walls, and they weren't made to keep. This is one of my favorites. This is the fowl at the fair. Mm -hmm. And I like this little rooster stepping out of the thing there. Mm -hmm. Now the next one is the poster resulting from that. Mm -hmm. And you can get a feel for uh, the main types of posters that they made either had the, the Panama PA at the top, and then the picture, and then the information, or they were like this. <laughs> now some of the artwork is very humorous too. I call this the potato head man. Um, at the state fair here in Michigan and a lot of county fairs, there are still competitions for scarecrows and for vegetable uh, ornamentation. Um, some fairs have an area where they create quilts <coughs> or pictures with vegetables. And so this, again, this reflects um, the audience and the fair. And this one is fun. This is a two-part series. This is all the vegetables. They're getting ready for the race, for the competition. Go! <laughs> and we don't know who won, you know, but, but again, the fair brought people together to compete with their products, um, but the competition was towards improving. This is a really beautiful one, I think, influenced by Japanese art. Yes? Those three horses? Yes. This piece is one that's very common, and I, very common. I think that this is an original <coughs> Bear Publishing at this period of time, which would have been, again, the late 1800s, early 1900s. There were a lot of graphic books that artists had, and they could just kind of copy every calendars. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. This is a really nice piece, very big piece. Um, the one I just passed, uh, we had many different experts come and look through this collection with us. And a man who works with the American Trident Horse Association came and he, he was impressed with all of the uh, harness racing photos because he said they show a whole lot of different kind of harness configuration. And that's interesting. <coughs> also, the harness racing pictures show us the span between when the um, bike, the sulky, we call sulky now, is called a bike then, because it was a two-wheeled vehicle. Um, started out with the wheels very small and the person sitting very low. And as they learned more about racing and aerodynamics, the wheels got bigger and the person started seating higher so that they could see better. Here's another example, and I think most of the posters that we have in the collection are sample posters where they would produce a poster and then they would reproduce it in their catalogs. And sometimes they would make a big run of them and fold them all up and do them as a mailer and say, this is a sample and your, your fair's name can be here. Ingham, Ingham's big fair. 
And I think the, lay, the words are fun. Droves of stock, hundreds of sites, crowds of people, acres of exhibit, tillers of soil and toilers of industry come to the fair. <clears throat> now the fair, as I said, was an educational institution. Um, much of the education happened informally as you, as you shared and talked with one another and could observe the impact of different people's technique. <coughs> At many fairs, at most fairs, there was an agricultural lecture. And this picture can be a little confusing. There's two little pictures at the top. Um, the one on the left is down, like in the main picture, down on the stage, and that's a politician giving a lecture. And the one on the right is like an inset. That's the tent from the outside. And they have um, a, a space between the top of the wall and the roof of the tent for air ventilation. But again, people got dressed up pretty good to come out here. Often the agricultural lecture <coughs> would occur, and then after the lecture they would announce the major prizes, and then there might be a band competition or a dance and a band performance. This one is fun, especially for us in Michigan, because there was never a World's Fair in Houghton. Um, and so this is a sample. And here's another one where this is the result of translating an artwork to lithograph, and here is the original artwork. <clears throat> and usually an, art, an artist would draw the drawing, and then a technician would translate it to the litho, and most in the translation, a lot was lost often. <clears throat> Another smart lady and her daughter at the fair. Children were very important to fairs as they are now. Um, many fairs even today are focused on children and youth education and youth experience um, through practical learning. And the fair publishing house, every year they do a catalog and the catalog covers are very important and there are many covers that include children on the cover. There's some original artwork for a cover in 1905. <coughs> This little guy is fun because his red tag says first premium. And in Canada today, red is first. Uh, blue is first in most cases in, in um, the states here. But at some point in the past, um, red was number one. And here's his sister, I think. Again, dressed up. Look at those little patent shoes. I had a pair of patent shoes like that when I was little. Here's another um, race, uh, a cover of a catalog for racing uh, tickets. And again, there's a pet. So the fair, the fair really encompassed everything in the community and tried to reflect it. Some beautiful fashion. Lots of the fair artwork includes well-dressed men and women, a lot of women. And as today, um, sex sells. And there we have it, 1890, 1895, or something like that. Here's another example of um, the lithograph. And we just have a fraction of this piece. Here's the original. Look at that beautiful dress. I'll go back and you can see the change. And then here's another cover. Uh, and again, um, we have women and women's work being important enough to put on an app, on a catalog to sell fair posters and tickets. <coughs> and this, um, I don't think I have the picture. <coughs> here's another fashionable piece. And in the white part, right in here, um, that would be where you would put the words. Um, Menominee Fair, the dates, come one, come all. But here's a very fashionable lady and obviously a, a winning stallion to promote the fair. A dapper gent. And these old guys, um, I'm sure they're talking about going to the fair. Uh, this is totally an unusual piece in that in the whole collection, but it's interesting. And again, 
Here's a couple with a prize winning stallion. I bet you looked at the lady first. Here's another one. And the fair um, began to introduce entertainment in the late 1800s, uh, but the entertainment was the marching band, for example, um, performers, hot balloon ascensions where the balloon would just go up and come down. People would do acrobatic acts on the balloon. I remember at the Illinois State Fair when I was a little girl, they had a high wire and a motorcycle person would drive along the high wire and acrobatic people would do things beneath them. This was before the midway when the fair began to broaden itself. When I came across this piece, um, and this is the local uh, volunteer fire brigade demonstrating their skills at the fair. And I wondered if it was out of place. And then one other thing we have in the collection is a, is a manual about how to do a successful fair <coughs> written by J. Ford Lanning, who was the owner of the fair publishing house. And he ultimately was a Supreme Court judge. He was a legislator. But all his life, he loved fairs. And <coughs> he is the one that commissioned all this artwork to make posters to, to advertise the fairs with. And he has in there that you need to bring in your whole community. The business people need to have demonstrations and exhibits at the fair. And you need to have um, all the services there so that the community can know what to do and community can know the resources that it has there. So this was both kind of a public service announcement, but it was also entertainment at the fair. And our, our museum, the MSU Museum, has an annual folk festival. And many years ago, one of the featured things was firefighting traditions. And lo and behold, the Detroit Fire Department came and demonstrated this ladder walk in the back. A bunch of guys held up the ladder, and people ran up and ran down. And that's <laughs> I don't think anybody would shoot fireworks off from a <laughs> from a boat, uh, but fireworks and electric lights. When electric lights first began to be prominent, it was only the very wealthy that had electric lights, but also uh, major events and public events would show off lighting so that people could learn about it. Fairs were the first place that like homogenization of milk was promoted. Like um, Liz said, women's suffrage was promoted. Um, Irrigation was promoted, the new equipment, windmills. So electric lights and big celebrations were also brought to the fair. Car racing. And these are two, um, this style of poster is called a, a window card. And the ribbon is where it would say um, the Nagani Fair these dates. Um, and the lower triptych that has the cars on the left and the airplane demonstration on the right has a machine show in the middle. Um, that would have been the newest and the best um, equipment for farmers to come and see. And in all likelihood, that equipment was also demonstrated at the fair. Uh, many fairs had other kinds of entertainment and competitions, and sports was certainly one of them. Here's bicycle racing, football, and again, when I went through the collection, I thought, well, this really isn't fair, but then you see these in their old catalogs, and, and you have them written about um, by Mr. Lanny when he talked about how to make a good fair. Now, one thing that's interesting at this time that in these artworks, Minority individuals are portrayed. Um, the gentleman on the right, um, often they are animal handlers. Uh, there's one poster that has a, a black couple in the background at the poster. And this was at a time certainly when especially black people and Hispanic people were around in these communities, uh, but they usually weren't represented in artworks and pictures and images. And so uh, I think there, there aren't a lot of them in the collection that have minority individuals in the pictures, but the fact that they're there at all, I think, speaks to the broader accepting level of the fairs at this time. 
here's another piece where we have a black gentleman as an animal, animal handler in uniform. Clearly a prideful um, venture. And after the Civil War, uh, many freed slaves who were uh, excellent animal handlers went on to do employment in this area. And the fair also was a very social event. And here are, here are fashionable people having sherbet, um, watching the parade of champions. <coughs> And then here, here's kind of an ending piece showing a more complex fair with some major buildings. I think that fairs were our earliest convention center. They were often a park-like place, and as time went on, they had um, more and more permanent buildings. And then here's kind of a poster that almost has everything it could possibly have in it, even to the animal, the pets, at the top, and these are undoubtedly working dogs. And when you read old fair uh, premium books, or you read accounts in newspapers where um, they list all the competitions that there are at the fair and who won, there are evidence of working dogs being showed at fairs as well. Okay, and I'm. Uh, this is a catalog cover that I use at the end to say thank you for the Fair Publishing House. This is from a 1912 catalog. And they are in Norwalk, Ohio, south of Sandusky, and so they show on the back page of the cover that uh, every, they're the center of the world, the Fair <laughs> Publishing House. <laughs> so that's... <coughs> Um, if you have any questions, I'd be glad to answer your questions. Um, I did learn in thinking about doing this presentation that um, I think James, is that his name? James Turner, who was the son of um, James and Marion, was involved in either the Central Michigan Fair Association or the Northwest Fair Association here in this area, which for a time um, provided the state fair when the <coughs> grounds were at the at the Oldsmobile plant area now, and he was uh, highly criticized in the papers because he was involved in the fair when they actually lost the, the grounds because they couldn't pay their bills. Uh, but So there is a connection, I think back one or two generations from all of us, there is a connection <coughs> that touches fairs, and the most successful fairs that we have today that are continuing are heavily devoted to youth education and are very much um, celebrating the community, the community that it is. A lot of fair people, <coughs> if I say, what is, what is the thing um, that's core for fairs? The fair folks will say agriculture. Mm -hmm. and, and what I think it is, is I think it's education. Because agriculture, as I said earlier, was the industry at the early time. As that changes in time, um, the role of the fair is to educate consumers. And there really is nowhere that we can learn what I'll say is consumer 101, especially in agricultural and natural resources issues. There aren't places to learn that. We don't learn it in school. It's not part of curriculum. And in, unless we get information and access to information like that from fairs, um, we're, we're going to not get it. Any questions? Comments? Kind of interesting. When I think of fairs, though, I don't, because I have a 4-H background, I think of 4-Hers. Right. How they, they start in from the time they're 8, 9, 10, mm -hmm. on up until they're 20. Mm -hmm. Are these on exhibit at all? They were. They were on exhibit <laughs> at, the, uh, at the museum. We had an 8-month run. We had three exhibits that had to do with fairs. Fairs of yesteryear utilized this artwork and historic pictures. And um, today's fairs looked at contemporary fairs, and then we had a floral hall where we brought together a lot of things out of the collections of the museum uh, that were handmade, ornamental, decorative things, and had three exhibits. I brought you, if you're interested, this was a little postcard that we did for that exhibit, and there's some out here around the corner. If you'd like one, please have one. We have a 4-H exhibit at the museum right now. I know, I heard you. Yes, and 4-H is celebrating its anniversary and is seeking to document its own history. And if any of you are real fair lovers, I don't want to be too greedy, but we did produce a book 
The book has um, 16 center centerfold covers, <laughs> color, and a series of articles about agricultural fairs in America and Michigan, really a focused thing in Michigan. And if anybody's interested, they're $20. But thank you so much. I'm glad you came. And I'd be glad to a answer any questions or talk with any of you if you want to talk more. Thank you. There is another agricultural connection, if you will, oh, between, please. between this house and, and some of the things you were talking about. You mentioned James M. Turner, James Turner's son. Uh, James M. Turner and his brother-in-law, Frank Dodge, uh -huh. um, operated a farm that was very famous for its livestock. What's now uh, Fenner Arboretum oh, is the tail okay. end of that farm. Oh. And that was, the, per, the city purchased uh, that, what is the Fenner Arboretum now, from Scott Turner, who was James Turner's son. Okay. And he raised the whole shorthorns. area south of Lansing there was, was 1,200-acre farm, at least. According to some people, it was 2,200 acres. But they were famous for their livestock. Mm -hmm. And especially shorthorns. Um, yeah. Some of the information that the state fair records indicates that mm -hmm. they showed in one yeah. periodically. So although Frank Dodge was a lawyer and, and James M. Turner was a railroad baron and so on, uh, they were both involved in agriculture too. Well, I understand you have a tour next. Uh, yes, for anyone who's interested in, in a tour, and you might be if, if you've been to the house before, uh, some of the recent restoration was begun, while well, you'll find some changes. If there should, are any people who like to learn, I have my hand oils on the wall here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.